All right, welcome to the commentary version of this video. This is a model 1873 trapdoor socket bayonet. We started production in, well, 1873, which is about seven years after the Civil War, but the bayonet has really strong ties to the Civil War. By the end of the war, there are about a million maybe bayonets in military warehouses. Most of them were the 1855 model. And when the 1873 model came out, they produced it from scratch for a little while. But they figured out pretty quick, it seems, that they could just go back and cold press the socket size down on the 1855 to the size for the 1873 and then blew it and called it an 1873. So that's what they did quite frequently, if uh, what I read is correct. The hardness here on this out of the box is about 50 or just under 50. When we spark it, it looks like sort of medium carbon steel. There's definitely flowering and bursting there, but the sparks are a little long, not quite as copious. I think it's best if we throw it in the fire, try to quench it and see if we can make it harder by, by a water quench. And the answer is not really. It's still sort of just over 50, maybe 52 or something like that. So I'm going to cut off the socket and then take it to the anvil, flatten out a piece, and we'll try to do a test run of carburization and see if we can successfully add some carbon. There's a couple reasons I want to hammer it. First, I want to get a piece for carburization testing that is very close in profile to the final knife that I'm going to carburize. So I'll have a better idea of the carbon uptake and if it's, you know, how it behaves and all that stuff. And then I want to know that I can forge it and hammer it without it cracking and doing some other crazy stuff. And it, it does that just fine, so that's good. I'm going to put it in my canister with this powdered charcoal and then about one-third calcium carbonate. We'll seal it up with a welder and get it into the heat treat oven at 1900 degrees for about three hours. So the model 1873 was issued up into World War I. I think, if I read correctly, it, it may have seen some action there, which I think is really fascinating. This bayonet with, you know, closely tied to the Civil War and still seeing an action in World War I. That's quite a time span. So if this model is a cold-pressed 1855 version, then the steel was probably made in England through the cementation process of iron, whether, whereas if it's an 18 73 original, uh, the steel might have been made by the Bessemer process, which became commonplace in the interim. In, in any case, the steel for these bayonets most likely came from England and was imported into the United States. You can see there that there may be a few more sparks with the carburized version. It's sort of hard to tell. So I'm going to put it in the etchant and we'll see the top one is our carburized piece. Maybe it's a little darker, indicating more carbon. It's still a little bit hard to tell. I think the best thing to do is just go ahead and quench it and see if it can uh, harden up. It would be much more usable if the HRC was closer to 60. So it's actually skating the 65 HRC file. And I'll put a, just a regular file on it, which is usually about a 63 to 65 HRC, and it skates that too. So. We're in good shape. This is turning out pretty uh, hopeful. I'd like to take this area and use it as the tang. And I have to be pretty careful. I want to preserve that U.S. stamp there at the base of the bayonet. So I'm going to use a wooden mallet for a lot of this and take a lot of care not to mark up what is going to be the Ricasso area. So even if the bayonets were made in the United States, and they were, not all of them, but they were. The steel came um, from England, which I think is interesting. At the time of the American Revolutionary War, it sounds like bayonets were often individually forged. There wasn't a lot of mechanization involved, and they were almost always iron, and some of them had carbon steel tips or a carbon steel rod going through it. Carbon steel was much less common and more expensive. By the time of the Civil War, there was new manufacturing. Steel was more readily available. 
and they had factories, for example, that could turn out maybe a thousand a day or more of these. They would have these sets of rollers um, that would have sequential grooves cut in them, and you would take the hot piece of steel and run them through the grooves, uh, you know, in a, in a row, and by the time it got to the last groove, it was shaped like a bayonet. It's pretty neat. So I think there's going to be some people upset that I've quote-unquote destroyed a historical relic, but there was millions of these, or at least a million or more of these, <laughs> and they're, they're actually quite common. This is not one of the rare, more collectible versions of, of a Civil War era bayonet. They go for about 80 bucks, maybe 40 to 100 bucks, somewhere in there. This one was 85 on eBay. There's a dozen or more of these sold in a week. and. Um, they're certainly interesting, and they are, I guess, collectible to an extent, but this is not a Civil War relic of, uh, you know, of museum interest. I didn't break into the Smithsonian, you know what I'm saying? So while I was reading about the bayonet and researching this project a little bit, I would stumble across all these accounts of the Civil War, and I really began to get... It was very moving, I think, in a lot of ways, and I would, you know, and I think the thought occurs to all of us at some point about what it would be like to be a soldier or, or a young man or a boy uh, throughout history, sitting in a trench or crouched behind a wall, and hear the order fix bayonets. I mean, how terrifying. I mean, you know, within a couple minutes, you're going to be face to face with another man frantically trying to kill you. And in that time, you will either be clubbed to death or violently run through with a knife or bayonet, or you'll be doing something to someone that you will never forget. And all the while, maybe you're wondering why you aren't a world away with, a, with your family or with your child or loved one. It's not that, you know, these people would fight and die for each other in that moment, given the choice they'd fight by their brothers, and that's, that's a great thing. And the fact that people are willing to do that so the rest of us can carry on you know it's it's an amazing thing but I think it's very sad that they have to there's a lot of accounts of the fighting uh, in the Civil War and especially a lot of really sort of stirring accounts around Gettysburg it's a, a three-day battle it was witnessed by a lot of the citizens of Gettysburg and there's just this stunning and even really beautiful imagery used by the soldiers and officers as they describe the, the fighting and it's a, such stark contrast to what they're describing, you know, that's very poetic and um, I don't know that they intend it to be that way, but it's got this sort of otherworldly melancholy that just permeates these accounts. And I think that's sort of where my head is at while I'm making this bird and trout knife. I, I'm, yeah, I'm putting a flower in a gun barrel, but uh, part of me feels like I'm trying to take that moment of terror out of their life forever and put something that belongs there in its place, maybe. I'm just going to do a little bit of grinding here. Most of the grinding is going to come after heat treatment. It's a thin piece, and again, we just don't want to risk a lot of warping or having to manipulate it after heat treatment to straighten out things or deal with cracks or whatever. So if what I read is correct, bayonets were carried often by soldiers. I think they were standard issue, but they weren't necessarily used that often in actual hand-to-hand -hand fighting. They had more of this psychological impact where, you know, you, you see someone running at you uh, with a sharp, shiny thing, and you're like, oh, snap. And, and so they were employed in that fashion, but the uh, number of wounds and mortalities associated with them is allegedly somewhere between one and two or three percent. I guess it depends what you read, which is maybe six thousand to, to ten or fifteen thousand soldiers in the entire war. So it's not that melee combat was uncommon. The best I can tell, it was fairly common. This is going to be our new canister. We're going to close up the end, put our knife in there with more of our. Uh, charcoal powder that's pre-mixed with the calcium carbonate in this case seal it up into the oven for the same length of time as our last test piece it's just that 
uh, soldiers had learned that the bayonet wasn't all that effective and they would use the butts of their rifle or a fighting knife that their loved ones sent them from home or a sword. The concept of charging and fixing bayonets it wasn't as common in the Civil War, but it, it did happen. Especially, there's some sort of famous events around Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge, and uh, I forget the name of that. There's a hill on day two or early day three where there's a lot of fighting, and the Union soldiers ended the fighting with a charge, a bayonet charge, and um, super interesting to read about. I'm going to file in some shoulders before we do the heat treating and then it's into a uh, steel foil packet that we're going to try to tighten up as best we can for the heat treat oven where we're going to do some normalization at 1550 degrees then 1525 then 1500 degrees and after that we're going to quench it from 1525 degrees in the heat treat oven in parks 50 oil So if you're observant during the quench, you'll notice that I've put some furnace cement along the spine, sort of in the pattern of a would-be hamon, but that's to keep the spine sort of soft. I'm not planning on tempering this very soft. It's going to temper hard. Uh, you know, a thin knife, I want it to have just sort of this sharp, hard edge. But I would like the spine to be soft, so if I get a hamon out of this, that's great. If it just ends up keeping the spine soft in a differential hardening process, that's fine too. So we've tempered at 390 degrees for about an hour and a half, twice, and now we're set to grind. I've put this file guard on there so that my plunge lines will be symmetric side to side. And it also has the added benefit of covering up the U.S. stamp that's still visible, and that way I don't accidentally mark it up or, or grind on it. Yeah, it's a dead of winter. It's like 18 degrees outside. So even though my garage door is shut, it's flipping cold. Is forging while it's hot outside fun? Nope, but there comes a uh, cold weather temperature where the fun also stops. <laughs> and this project spent a lot of time in that temperature range. I'm going to work on the guard now. Alex Steele was very kind and he sent me some wrought iron. I haven't etched it to see what the pattern's going to be like, but I'm really interested at this point knowing that it could be quite decorative and really cool. Iron, of course, is softer than steel, even mild steel, and so uh, even though it is time consuming, it's much easier to file the tang hole in here than, than in a steel guard or. That is some slicing blade geometry right there. Time for the moment of truth, which is going to go in the ferric chloride. And we'll see, did we get a hamon? Is this a quench line? Is there anything visible there at all? If there's a hamon, it might suggest that the carbon content is quite high. And so I can't really tell. Is that a hamon? Is it a quench line? There's an area towards the end of the knife on one side that looks very wispy and much like I would expect the hamon to look. 
there are other areas that I don't know. It could be Hamon, could just sort of be a little quench line type of thing. In either case, the indication there is that there's some differential hardening going on, and I'm, I'm satisfied with that. I bought some snake wood. I love the look of this wood. I've never used it before. It's very expensive. This piece is about ooh, about eighteen dollars. And it seems I'm just not going to learn the lesson about force grinding and, and hot grinding and heating things up because it cracks wood, some wood. And this is an example of uh, overzealous grinding, cracking the wood. So I've whipped out the bacote or bacote. I don't know how you pronounce it, but. I've never used it for, before and I actually like it quite a bit. It's hard, it seems durable, it drills easy, it sands easy, it doesn't splinter when I drill it. You know, that's really nice. And it takes a, uh, takes a good polish. It looks, it looks very pretty at the end of this. I'm getting more and more into bedding tangs where I put some epoxy to fill all the gaps in the handle, wrap the handle in some saran wrap and coat that with wax usually and then uh, seed it in the epoxy and let it dry and then take it out it makes the final fit up easier and, and when you're trying to make everything line up uh, grinding and surfacing the knife and the handle it's much easier to do when everything's fixated in place and bedding the tang is part of that process I can drill a hole for example the pinhole now without worrying that it's going to shift uh, between drilling the hole and when I do the final fit up. So it has a lot of, of advantages. I had to use olive oil <laughs> in this case on the saran wrap because I dropped my wax and it was in a glass bottle and it just, you know, globulated over my entire uh, garage floor. So I'll have to order some more. All right, so the, the tang is bedded, and there's a pin halfway through here to keep everything in place and in its final position, and then we're going to grind and flush up all our surfaces and, and shape our handle here. As usual, I'm going to start with about 220 grit on the wood, go to 400, then 600, then 800. I usually stop about 800. There's, I guess, some wood that does a little better with higher, higher grit, but I think in this case, 800 is enough. And as for the oil, you know, as usual, Danish oil. I don't know any better. Like, I, I'm just not that sophisticated with all this. Danish oil's got a couple of different oils within it, so it's really sort of an amalgam of different stuff. And I figure that uh, it's like throwing, you know, if you throw enough stuff against the wall, something sticks. And, you know, that's my super sophisticated approach to uh, treating wood. I've etched our guard, and it looks really cool. I fitted it up. It's a, it's a fairly snug fit, but again, we use some JB Weld here to fill in the gaps. We don't want moisture accumulating under the handle. I've used a steel pin here only because I didn't have nickel silver and I, I'm, I don't like stainless steel pins. They take a lot of hammering and that's just more opportunity to dent up your wood and have other issues. It gets hotter when you grind it away and you can burn your wood and scorch your wood. So I meant to use nickel silver that's actually stainless steel I think. 
this is a coarse medium stone you know one side's one one's the other and I'm gonna walk it up some water stones to about 16,000 grit I have a new Shapton glass water stone and I love it uh, so I'm still trying to learn my way around it and after the 16,000 grit Shapton glass I've got some submicron rouge on a strop so this got pretty sharp that guard with the etching and proximity to that U.S. stamp, I'm really, I really like that, you know, about this knife. And I'm glad it turned out the way it did. This bird and trout knife, it's been just one of my favorite projects of all time. And it really, I just took me real deep, man. Like, I probed myself. I probed myself deep here. Uh, I got to reflect on the human condition and courage and cruelty. And on a personal level, I feel like I got to bring something wholesome and maybe even spiritual out of this instrument of war and terror and all that. At any rate, I hope you guys enjoyed the build. Have a good one. I signed in at 18 for a cold